I was going to give us uh, folks an update. Um, it's actually a, a very uh, uh, it's it's uh, just letting you know about our move first. So let me go forward on the slide. Okay. Okay, hold on. Uh, so I, I think hopefully all our new users know that we are moving to um, uh, a new facility back on the main Berkeley Lab campus. We've been in Oakland for, is it 12 years? Um, we've been here. So our temporary location um, has turned into be more, more than a decade, and so we're very excited to be getting back up onto the main Berkeley Lab campus and closer to uh, our, our research division and other, other members of the laboratory, and also to move into this really um, uh, amazing new building that you guys are all going to have to come uh, and visit. So um, this is going to be a, a major project for NERSC in, in 2015, to move the systems and um, <coughs> and then move ourselves as, as well up to the hill. And so what I basically want to do today is uh, formally announce that we are moving and that there will be some uh, downtime at when we do the moves. Now, we are finalizing the move plans, um, and when we have that in place, uh, I'm going to have Jeff Broughton come to, um, on to one of these calls and give a very detailed move um, uh, move meeting. So this is, I guess, sort of the just the appetizer plate of the of the move. <coughs> so um, as I mentioned, this it's going to be a very busy year um, uh, for NERSC. And so this is this is our current thinking. And again, um, we'll get you more details as soon as we have it. So. Uh, we're expecting, so Edison, the Edison system is going to move from Oakland to um, the CRT or the new facility. And so we're expecting, we're saying at this point, um, a conservative up to six weeks of Edison downtime in uh, Q3 or Q4 of 2015. Uh, we also expect a couple weeks of downtime um, for HPSS, the storage archive system. And then for the file systems, I mean, our file systems teams are working really hard to um, to give you as much continuity on the file system as possible and not to have as much downtime. So we basically have a, a temporary variable of, of storage. We're going to copy um, data from, uh, from our project and home file systems to this um, other temporary file system. We're going to move it up the hill. But then there's going to be some time to set it up, and so there's going to be uh, some syncing that we're going to need to be doing across the network. Um, differences between what the file system that's running down uh, in Oakland versus up on the hill. And so there's going to be some periods where the, the I.O. will be slower as the data is synced between Oakland and the new facility. Yeah, And then, um, you know, we, we do expect some some interruptions on on the other services. So, for example, we'll have to move the <coughs> the science gateways from if one place to another. We'll have to move the NX service from one to another. So there will be some intermittent downtimes um, on on all the services as as we move. Um, okay. So then, what's happening to the systems that aren't moving? So, um, Dirac. Carver and Hopper are going to be retired in our Oakland facility. Uh, our new facility actually can't support uh, Hopper, and um, and both Hopper and Carver are running to end of a life. So this is a over a year in advance warning for um, the cop, uh, Hopper and Carver retirements that will take place uh, next summer, uh, end of next summer. And Dirac is is really getting um, old right now. And so we're scheduling to retire that. We've uh, had a lot of uh, hardware fallout on Dirac already uh, at the end of this year. So, yes. <coughs> um, I had been talking with, with Jeff and co about Carver because obviously we have the plank nodes on Carver. Uh, and my understanding was that that would be kept up till the end of the calendar year. Uh, okay, I will check with Jeff on the, the specific Planck nodes. Um, I thought he was saying the end of the summer, but I know we have notes from that that call, so I will check with that. Can you can one of you guys take a note on on that? I think the 
the bottom line, as you, as you look at here, is we're, we're not going to leave you without a system, okay? So um, if we have some, you know, delays, we're going to make sure that Hopper stays running until uh, Edison up is up, or uh, we're also actually working on an, um, a system that is going to fill the gap of hours. We're looking at options for this between um, Harvard, uh, Hopper's retirement and when the Cori system uh, comes uh, online. Oh, shoot, and I have a typo there, which is June of 2016. Um, that's not 15, which is... I'm, I'm going to change it right now because that's uh, good. I thought bad. you meant that you were looking at options to fill the gap in June of 2015. Oh, maybe that's maybe I. I, I, th I think I didn't mean that actually. Um, right. <coughs> so um, as I said, we're not going to leave you without without a system. There will be a system um, to run on, and so this is the information we can share with you right now. And um, Jeff Broughton is working very hard on the on the move plan, and um, you know we have a deliverable to get the move plan. Um, to DOE uh, pretty soon within the next um, uh, month or so, so we will we will definitely get you more detailed information about um, the system moves, when the systems will be down, um, and how the services will be affected. Are th are there other questions on the move? I have an action from Julian to check on the plunk nodes. Are there other other questions? Okay, so then, the, yeah, go ahead. What, what are the ideas right now for filling the gap? I mean, you're looking for options, but you must have something in mind. Um, yeah, we're basically looking for um, uh, a hopper, you know, a replacement for hopper. So when we have out your maintenance, um, it starts to cost us a lot to keep a, a system running. And so we're looking at sort of the trade-offs between keep our, uh, keeping hopper running versus actually um, buying a replacement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I guess you'll tell us more. Yeah, we'll definitely tell you more. This is just, you know, we I, we think we realized we had never uh, on a nug call actually said that uh, we are moving, and you know, we do expect some downtime uh, next summer. Yeah, but we are expecting a flat allocation regime, and for to not go down at three billion hours for 2014, 15, yeah. and 16. Yeah. Did you guys? Did people hear Francesca? So we're expecting a, a flat allocation year. So we're not expecting a dip in allocations in uh, the next dip, year. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's good. Well, I'm sorry, it's, it's a cut compared to normal. Uh, well, it's, it's like we're not getting a new system in, um, right? So. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, we would tip. We, we typically remain flat for two or three years at a time, and then we get a big step function in the allocations, and then it remains flat for a couple of years. And, um, so we are just extending the flat period here by a year or so because of the long lead time for, for NERSCAPE. And that will be a big step. That yeah. will be a big step. Yeah. All right, so then let me move on to uh, the, the NERSC Exascale Science Application Program. So on Tuesday, um, we launched this program, and I sent an um, email to all users. And so this is the program which is going to be the umbrella program for all of our application readiness um, activities for the Cori system. So we've, we've talked about the Cori system on the last uh, NUG call, and we, we know and we expect that applications are going to have to make some changes in order to get and um, good performance on Cori. And so what we have done is we put out this call, and what we're going to do is choose um, approximately 20 application teams to closely work with as part of this NESAP, or Nurse Exascale Science Application Program. And the, the 20 or so teams that are part of the program will um, have access to a, a, will have a partner on the Nurse app red Application Readiness Team. And they'll also be able to access a lot of the resources from Cray and Intel that we negotiated into the NERSC 8 contract. Um, and as part of this, NERSC is, is also funding uh, eight uh, postdocs. So let me go to the next slide and get into a few more, form, few more details. So if you're part of the NESAP uh, project or program, um, 
you know, as I mentioned, you'll have a, a partner on the app readiness team. Um, you'll have access to the Cray and Intel resources. And what this is is uh, we've, we have d these dungeon sessions where uh, an ap application teams can, will be able to go down to um, Intel's office um, or maybe up to Intel's office in Portland and sit and work with uh, the Intel developers on a particular kernel uh, in your code. And I guess it's a dungeon session because you, you sit in a room for a couple days without a window. Um, and so this is a real good opportunity to work with the experts who have uh, knowledge of the Cori processor. Also, as part of that, we're, um, we'll be giving or allocating up to a million additional hours for each of the NESAP teams. Um, the NESAP teams will have um, early access to Knight's Landing um, prototype hardware. So some of these, this hardware could be remote accessible to uh, Intel's test beds, and we will have a few um, uh, Knight's Landing processors here early in uh, late 2015. And then we ex expect to give the, the folks in the NESAP uh, program um, significant early access on the full Cori system. And then finally, um, we are funding um, eight postdocs, and we will be p placing uh, the postdocs uh, within application teams that are part of NESAP. So, we don't have 20 postdocs. We only have um, we only have eight, and so approximately 40 40 percent of the NESAP teams will have um, a nurse-funded uh, postdoc as part of that team. So the, the you're going to have 40 percent of the teams having a full-time postdoc rather than say 80 percent of the teams having a half-time postdoc. Yeah, um, I think I don't think we can uh, we want to split their time in that way. Um, and, and we also know that you know some some teams are are really far along already, um, and so they'll be part of you know uh, NESAP and their access to the developers and the Cray developers and the Intel experts will get them uh, you know a long way on their on their own. And, and this will be like one year of a postdoc, or it's uh it's actually a two year postdoc program. That's what we have funding for um, uh, right now. Yeah. Okay, and so you know, if you're part of NESAP, um, you'll be responsible for working with your application readiness partner to do code profiling and, and create scaling plots. And so I, we don't want to give off the impression that um, uh, that the app readiness person is going to be doing uh, the work, all the work for you. In fact, um, they're here to assist the application teams, and the, the app readiness folks are going to be working with, with numerous teams. And so we, we're asking people to you know, name and assign someone from your group who will be working on um, optimizing, porting, testing, uh, testing the code. And of course, we'll ask you for uh, um, <laughs> your results and probably to write them up as well. And, and so the criteria we're going to use to evaluate these um, proposals are um, how, how well is, is the application um, how used in the DOE Office of Science. Uh, so we have a very uneven distribution of applications at NERSC, and so we'll, we'll be looking at um, how, much, how much time do they use on, um, on the NERSC systems and across other DOE platforms and, and really the, the importance to the DOE. We'll look for representation among all of the um, six offices. Um, and then we'll also, you know, we're looking at how can the work that we do and the work that uh, comes out of this be generalized to the broader community, right? So um, are there reusable libraries or algorithms or kernels or is this a community code? That, that would be considered a, a benefit. And then um, we'll also look at the resources that the applications teams um, propose to match with the NERSC and vendor resources. So those applications are due um, June 30th. I don't think we tried to make the application process not, not very onerous, so it's, it's not very long. We already know all your you know, science areas from, from um, ERCAP each year. Uh, so I, I do encourage um, everyone to, to apply. I think you can do it um, um, you know, in a half hour or so. 
think that's. Are there questions on um, NISAP? Okay, I guess we go to Jack now. Okay, thanks. Actually, can I have a, a very quick question? Sure. So, are we going to be under NDA uh, non disclosure? Uh, to share your screen. Yeah, um, so we've been working with uh, Intel to release a lot of information about the Knight's Landing processor. And um, as, a, as opposed to in past procurements when we've just said, oh, an Intel processor is coming, you know, we've been able to say a lot about the number of cores. And uh, um, so, th so that's one, is we're trying to get not do as m too many NDA uh, presentations, get as much information out to you as possible. There's a few things Intel is still holding very close, and um, we can do NDA presentations for the, the folks in NISAP. Um, and so you would just have to sign an individual NDA if your organization doesn't uh, have one already. But uh, uh, that okay. we will d we'll definitely do that. And I expect Intel to make some more announcements at ISC, um, that's International Supercomputing Conference, that's um, in another month, oh. month or so. So uh, look for more information on the processor there as well. And I expect, okay. I mean, it, it's common with a lot of our new machines that until the machine is actually accepted, we ask users not to release any performance information, that they can still release science results. Yeah. Uh, but withhold actual performance studies until after the machine okay. has been accepted. And yeah. that might be we'll true to in this case, too. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to see. I think in, um, what, what happens on this one, we'll work with Intel to see. And part of it, I think they want to get the, they probably want to get the good stories out there. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, we'll have to see how, uh, what, they're, what they're doing. We don't have hardware for another um, uh, year or so. Did, did you have a question, Stefan? Hmm? Did you have a question? Oh, okay. No, so, no, it was just about the NDA. Uh, right. Yeah. So we've had okay. people, we're already working on getting some codes ready um, for this, and we've been working for a while. And so we thought we would present at the, the teleconferences and starting today and in coming months some of the case studies of, of what we've done and what we've learned. So Jack is going to present the first one for us. So Jack, the slip is, is next. Right. So the, the context of these case studies is that these sort of came out of our, out of our um, phase one application readiness effort. So this is kind of an overview of what of what that was. So in phase one, it is sort of wrapped up at this point, but it was it sort of happened over the last year or year and a half. And we, you know, looked at the nurse workload and, um, you know, split it into sort of science categories or codes that are sort of um, have, have similar needs. And we, we identified about 14 of these. I'm going to talk to you one about one um, one representative code today, and then we'll have some more talks. I think in the next, uh, in the next several uh, NUG teleconferences. Um, at this point, we had basically been um, looking at these codes and trying to identify um, how how uh, how well these codes are ready to use sort of on node parallelism, both in terms of OpenMP and in terms of vectorization. And then, um, and then, and try to really gather just some lessons learned on on what we can do when we really go into the to phase two, which I think is what Katie had just been saying. So that NESAP is um, or NESAP is is, uh, is 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 a big part of, of phase two. Um, we also have a few other things going on. Uh, one of which is to sort of meet with some key application developers and hold workshops. Um, at NERSC, um, and then the, there's a, uh, there's going to be a sort of a wide number of training, uh, both online and I think in person, happening at NERSC over the next couple of years. Um, so this the, this was the team members for the application readiness team. So I'm, I'm basically putting this up there in case you're particularly interested in one code or one um, sort of one domain. You can really quickly jot down this person's name and uh, and get in touch with them to see how uh, application readiness is, is sort of going to um, roll out in that domain. Okay, so then the. Uh, that slide. 
we, we need to update this slide. Is that what you said? This was this was phase one. Yeah, so this I is, about three months ago. Oh. Okay. Yeah, this was the phase one. Yeah, uh, this people, was the phase so. one team. Okay, so let's go into the the just the first case study, and you'll you'll hear other case studies, uh, as I said, in the next couple uh, NUG teleconferences. So this was uh, a code that I worked on. I worked on it when I was in grad school, and I've continued working on it a little bit since then. Um, so this is somewhat representative of um, material science codes in the sort of the DFT realm, and that it depends on algorithms, it heavily depends on FFTs and dense layer algebra. And then we also have some large um, sort of hand-tuned reduction type loops. Um, and so I, when I was going about sort of the phase one analysis of this code to see, you know, the, the readiness status, um, at the, at the beginning we already knew that we were sort of failing our, our, our users in, 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 in the fact that we had only an MPI only programming model. Um, and this was obviously going to be uh, a failure for app readiness if we, if we didn't change it as well. So we, we, we took the opportunity to kind of kill two birds with one stone. And the reason why this was kind of failing our users already was that, um, you know, the users basically want to do bigger systems, more atoms all the time. And big systems tend to require more memory. In, in our case, it scales as like the number of atoms squared. So, you know, in a perfect world, um, your, the, the MPI implementation of any code would perfectly distribute memory across all the MPI tasks, and so you could always fit any problem in memory so long as you scaled to, to a higher number of tasks. Uh, in practice, though, you know, to avoid duplication uh, or to avoid communication, um, the data is often duplicated on each MPI task. So there's always some sort of overhead per MPI task. Um, and in practice, this sort of limits the, the size of the systems you can study. Um, so for example, like uh, in years past on Hopper, users were forced to sort of often use maybe one of 24 available cores in, over, in order to fit their problem into, into memory. And then this is obviously not ideal because essentially 90% of your computing capability is lost when you do something like that and you don't back it up with any kind of uh, threading model. So the idea was to, to add threads, and we wanted to do so in a way that didn't really target Hopper or the machines that our users were currently running on, but was sort of forward thinking and targeting really many core systems where you don't want just sort of a handful of threads, but you may want um, tens or, or even, or, or potentially even hundreds uh, of threads. So that's the sort of context we went about optimizing the code. Um, so this plot shows you some sort of the steps we took um, uh, to evaluate and optimize this code on our testbed uh, Xeon Phi cluster called Babbage, which I think um, you can apply for access to now. So we started off with a code that was MPI only, and uh, essentially in this case it didn't even run on the Xeon Phi, or our test problem couldn't be run in a reasonable way on the Xeon Phi in MPI only mode. Uh, this was essentially because of the, <coughs> you know, pretty tight memory requirements that existed on on the Knight's Corner um, cards that are that are in Babbage. Uh, I think that uh, Corey's nice landing will be a, a lot more forgiving, in this sense. But still, the amount of memory per MPI task in a pure MPI mode uh, would be quite small. Uh, so the first thing we did was we basically wanted to refactor the code so it had the following form: an outer loop. Um, that was large enough to basically be parallelized with MPI, an inner loop that was um, uh, that that we were targeting for OpenMP, and we wanted to basically um, make sure that that was large enough to still sort of saturate tens or hundreds of threads, and then a very innermost loop that we also wanted to still be large enough <coughs> to, uh, uh, to to really vectorize well and not. Um, and so that we wouldn't really have to worry about sort of memory alignment issues. And so we were able to do this. It's sort of fortunate. Not, every, not all codes can re be written in such a form, but this is one that could sort of easily uh, be written in such a form. And so we refactored it. Um, and you see that we, we got a little bit of boost in performance going just doing this refactoring. And this is largely due to sort of like memory locality um, improvements. 
Uh, at the next step, we added OpenMP to the loop that we targeted for OpenMP. Um, and you see that we can now actually fit the problem onto the, onto the Knight's Corner card um, and, and actually utilize every, every core, either as an MPI task or as an OpenMP thread. But the performance uh, you know, is somewhat disappointing, about two times slower than the performance of the, the host cores, which are Sandy Bridge on Babbage. And so the next step is basically to look at the code and really analyze um, whether, uh, whether the, the loops that we had targeted for vectorization were being vectorized or not. And uh, what we found was basically that they're not, that, that for various reasons the compiler could not optimize those loops. And I'll show you that in a second. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the last sort of optimization steps were um, cleaning up those innermost loops. You know, we removed some logic, we simplified some operations, and then eventually ensured that they were vectorized. And at that level, we were able to basically break even um, against the host with the, with the knight's corner. So I want to point out that, that, that optimizing your code on the knight's corner um, is, uh, can, be, can be challenging, but it's, it's um, and at the end of the day, you might ask sort of, you did all of this work and you're just breaking even on the knight's corner versus the, the Sandy Bridge hosts. So was this all sort of a waste of time? And I think that the, we expect that Knight's Landing will be a lot more forgiving. Uh, it'll be a lot, um, uh, a lot better. Yeah, it'll be, in general, it'll be a lot better. And the point is, is that if you optimize your code for Babbage on, the, on these Knight's Corner cards, then I think that you'll be in great shape um, for the next generation for Knight's Landing. Um, and one of the benefits um, of, of targeting Babbage is that while at the end of the day you may just break even against the host, um, the changes you make actually are, have a much bigger impact on the performance on Babbage. So it's easy, easier to kind of see the, um, the performance impact of things like vectorization and, and adding threads, for example. But uh, before you leave that, look at the difference between the blue on the right and the blue on the left. Right. right? Even, even ignoring the, the Babbage. So a lot of work went into it, but look at the gain you got on all, pla on all processors. Right, it's true. And so the, I think another sort of conclusion, and I'll talk more about this later, is that the changes you do make targeting <clears throat> the mini-core architecture do help um, even, even going back all the way to Hopper, for example. <clears throat> okay, so this is... Uh, was the first blue line corresponding to using <coughs> all the cores? Yeah, so on the, using all the cores on the host. Um, so either way, we saturated the number of cores on the host or we saturated the number of cores on the mic. Um, and the box at the right talks about four Xeon Phi cards. Uh, Does that mean the red thing would drop by to two-thirds its value or something? What is that? Yeah, I think this is uh, this is my fault. I think I copied that box from a different version of this slide. Um, so that I had uh, I had a few different tests running. Uh, that should say basically one Xeon Phi card. So the actual plot that you're seeing is one Xeon Phi against two Sandy Bridge. That I understood, but I wasn't sure if that was significant. Uh, so I think it's comparing four Xeon Phi cards to two Sandy Bridge chips or something. No, say the box is incorrect. Right. So, so the, the number in the box is not correct. So the, the, actual, the actual plot is comparing one Xeon Phi against two Sandy Bridges. The, uh, the, the legend at the top is correct. Right. The legend at the top is correct. So I, yeah. So we should just ignore what's in the box. Right, ignore what's in the box for now. There was so these are from some older, an older version of the slide. <clears throat> so this was um, this is a sort of simplified version of what the code looks like. There's some there's a bunch there's a few lines extracted and and I've condensed uh, I've condensed the code to look a little bit cleaner. Um, but this shows the the essentially the structure of the final um, <coughs> the final kernel. Um, 
So you can see this. there's an outer loop here that is typically of the size of sort of 100 to 1,000 um, iterations that is, uh, that is good for, for having many threads. There's, a, um, there's now a large inner loop. The original code actually had this loop here, this, one, this IW1 to 3 loop as the inner loop. And it's essentially too small to vectorize. Um, so one of the things we did was basically move this loop outside and kept the very innermost loop as something that's really quite large, 1,000 to 10,000 uh, elements. And so this was really good for vectorization. And <clears throat> when you have a loop that's, that's, that's that long and you're operating on arrays that long, it, you tend to not have to worry too much about um, uh, memory alignment, which can become uh, uh, quite important on at least the knight's corner. Um, and then you can see, uh, I've left this line in just for illustration purposes. We had some other things that broke vectorization, but this was, a, this, was a, this was one that you can sort of see how a programmer is thinking serially. So we had, we had a lot of logic in our loops that make sense in serial execution that we want to determine sort of at the beginning of the loop body whether this particular iteration of the loop is going gonna, is gonna to contribute in a meaningful way. And if not, we'll skip it, and we'll skip all the sort of operations that happen underneath. Um, you know, th this seems like a good idea, but in, in reality, it, it just breaks the vectorization because you essentially have a, a fork in the middle of your, uh, of your loop body. And so it ends up making the code quite slower. So it's essentially better to do work that contributes nothing than, um, than, than try to save uh, on work. So um, we had a whole bunch of different kind of logic uh, in the code that, that did this. And removing that is essentially what allowed the compiler to sort of auto-vectorize these loops. Um, so this is a slide that just shows this, this particular uh, job um, uh, performance when you consider the trade-off between MPI tasks versus OpenMP threads. So in this particular case, um, you can see that on the on the Sandy Bridge hosts, you get a pretty much a flat line um, using MPI versus OpenMP, whereas the blue line it's actually hard to see, but there's a slight minimum at 12 threads per MPI task here. Um, so that the optimal, the optimal configuration was 10 MPI tasks and then 12 threads per MPI task. You can see that there are some numbers missing, and that's because in, in this particular code, the problem will not fit into memory if you, if you use uh, pure MPI, uh, MPI mode. OK, and then the, and the final conclusion is sort of meanwhile back on Edison, if we look at the sort of performance of the beginning code versus the end code, uh, you see that we made some really uh, uh, huge differences. I guess this, you know, I, I'm almost shy about showing this because it, it means that the original code was obviously not particularly well optimized. Um, but the changes we made, both in refactoring memory locality improvements and vectorization, uh, sort of add up to make a really uh, pretty pretty large impact on the performance. Um, uh, just back on sort of a Xeon Ivy Bridge on on Edison. So that, that's the end of this first case study. We'll have a, a few more next week, but are there any, any questions? Or not next month, I guess. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jack. Anything yeah. else? So these um, case studies, are we putting them uh, up online? And so you can, if you go to the, the Cori web pages, we're going to be continuing to um, update these and provide uh, <coughs> more examples and of the work that we're doing. <coughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Just a quick question. So I guess you're not looking at any offloading, you know, having half of the work being done on the uh, Sandy Bridge and the other half on the Neon 5, right? Because Cori is not going to be that way. Right, that's exactly right. I mean, we're inspired by what we thought the next generation would look like and, and inspired now by, by Cori in particular. OK. Thank you. OK, anything else? If not, then we will speak with you all again next month.